and gentlemen, I'm Krishna C. Nadella, and welcome to Season 4 of State of Mind. We would like to thank Manhattan Neighborhood Network's Youth Channel for their partnership in this season's production. The Youth Channel is a cable and multimedia platform that focuses on highlighting media created by youth for youth while providing a pipeline for action. We start our fourth season with a two-part series entitled Welcome to the Human Race. Today's topic is about Black Lives Matter. Since the acquittal of George Zimmerman and the shooting death of Trayvon Martin in 2013, Black Lives Matter has become a nationally recognized international activist movement originating in the African American community, campaigning against violence and systemic racism toward black people. BLM regularly organizes protests around the deaths of black people and killings by law enforcement officers and broader issues of racial profiling, police brutality, and racial inequality in the United States criminal justice system. Understanding that the college environment has always been a breeding ground for social change, we're here today to understand BLM's place in the academic arena and how it relates to today's college students. With us here today to provide some much needed insight is Dr. Marley Balaji of the Hindu American Foundation. Marley, thank you for joining us again on State of Mind. Thanks so much for having me, Krishna. So let's kick off with a very high level question. Why is Black Lives Matter so important to talk about? It's so important because for many, many years, African Americans, particularly in areas where police interactions, criminal justice interactions with young African Americans, particularly African American men, uh, have felt that their voice has not been heard. And BLM provides not only a platform for expressing this frustration, but in many areas, a platform by which to constructively engage with law enforcement and other stakeholders. So its voice is important because BLM also reflects a generational change. It reflects a generational change from some of the, the more long form strategies of the NAACP or the Urban League, for example, to a more, I think, digitally oriented and fast paced response to uh, wrongful actions or alleged wrongful actions by the police. So from a generational standpoint, why are we seeing more instances now than we were in the past? Are, are there more instances or are we just highlighting them more often? No, I think social media plays a significant role in this. And that's why BLM has uh, emerged. Uh, you are able to see um, with uh, more clarity um, some of these interactions that end up being fatal. In the case, for example, of Sandra Bland, you saw the lead up to her being jailed and ultimately dying in police custody, or unfortunately seeing what happened to Eric Garner in Staten Island. All of these things are caught on tape. They're put on the internet within seconds of being filmed, and I think that creates an instantaneous response. So I'm not so sure that incidents are spiking as much as the incidents being caught on tape have definitely saturated um, our media consumption. And to that point, I want to read off of just a handful of names since Trayvon Martin who were also killed by police actions or while in police custody. Michael Brown, Eric Garner, Jonathan Farrell, John Crawford, Ezel Ford, Laquan McDonald, Akai Gurley, Tamir Rice, Eric Harris, Walter Scott, Freddie Gray, Sandra Bland, Samuel Dubois, Alton Sterling, and Philandro Castile. What do we need to do to bring communities together to prevent tragedies like the ones that were just mentioned, you know, to an end if possible? I think, first off, people who do not understand uh, what it's like for uh, young people of color, particularly uh, young African Americans and Latinos in their interactions with law enforcement as opposed to uh, groups who are not um, I interacting in the same way. Understanding why that perspective might have shaped uh, mutual distrust between both, uh, both sides. Um, understanding that goes a long way towards having some sort of constructive dialogue. And, you know, in, in reality, what we're seeing is quite a bit of progress at the local level. Okay. Um, in, in cities and other municipalities across the country where police chiefs um, or prosecutors are beginning to realize, you know what, there is a perception that 
we are having an adversarial relationship with the communities we're supposed to serve and protect. Right. So all of this is creating uh, opportunities for dialogue and some sort of constructive action. And I'll tell you, the perfect case in point was Tuesday's election in Philadelphia, where the new district attorney represented Black Lives Matter. Right. So again, you're seeing a shift in the way that communities and law enforcement are interacting with each other. And I think one of the things that folks outside of the African American community in large metropolitan areas can understand is, look, you really have to see what it's like to be um, subject to s stop and frisk for no reason or being unfairly targeted or profiled disproportionately uh, without cause. Um, that I think, it's more than sparking a conversation, it's about collective action. And I think right now, we're still moving towards a more empathetic um, you know, way of, of dealing with these issues. Um, and it's gonna take time. So, if we were to talk and extend the conversation to other groups, other uh, ethnic uh, parties who aren't part of Black Lives Matter, what is your response to All Lives Matter? And it's been something that obviously come up as a response, not necessarily in a positive light towards BLM. So one of the things that I think is interesting about that term All Lives Matter is that BLM is not saying that B Black Lives Matter and All Lives Matter are mutually exclusive. Right. It's that there's been a systematic dehumanization of African Americans, particularly when it comes to the criminal justice system. Rates of incarceration, uh, targeting, uh, you know, especially targeting uh, in communities where, um, you know, you have uh, not just uh, n not unequal access to education, but unequal access to uh, employment, as they call it, um, you know, the school to prison pipeline is very real in communities across the country. And that has to be dealt with. And so the term all lives matter, in my opinion, is an ideological cop-out. It doesn't actually address how we can get better and more equitable criminal justice approaches um, and more equitable access to things such as education, affordable housing, um, healthcare, and, and employment. So those are things that I think are at the heart of why BLM exists. And just saying all lives matter right. is, I think, fundamentally being tone deaf, or in my uh, more honest opinion, is a disingenuous uh, response. Okay, so clearly, whenever we try to convey a message, especially through the media, the media becomes part of the uh, narrative sometimes. Yeah. What is the media's responsibility with regard to the perception of African Americans in the community? Because I have to imagine there is a perception that was created by them, or at least you know, continue to be um, uh, proponent of whatever that image is. That's a complicated relationship. I think one of the things that's really critical here is dealing with um, incidents involving um, interactions with the criminal justice system among communities of color as a sustained and systematic coverage uh, point, not a one-off. Because it seems like we have these conversations. We have these conversations on gun violence, for example, and then we ignore them, mm -hmm. right? We had the Pulse shooting, then we have Las Vegas, and we just had Sutherland yeah. Springs. And we go back to our daily lives without really having that sense of action. I think in the same regard, you'll see these uh, incidents, uh, particularly that in, t in the deaths of uh, young African Americans, um, getting coverage for a few days and then kind of drifting away. In order for us, especially for media professionals, to you know help to try to address this problem through mm -hmm. coverage, I think it requires a more proactive approach. Sure. So, I want to stop you there because there is one narrative that hasn't gone away and it's the Colin Kaepernick kneeling uh, narrative that's basically become a weekly event within the National Football League. First of all, what are your thoughts on that? Why is this one different? And have we lost the message 
in terms of the whole kneeling concept and what it's supposed to represent? I'll answer the, the first, uh, I'll answer the last part of your question first. Yes, we've lost the message. Um, and Eric Reed of the San Francisco 49ers, who was the first person to join Collar and Kaepernick uh, in, in kneeling when they were both on the San Francisco 49ers, um, said, said it best. He said, you know, we've completely lost what the reason for the kneeling was. The kneeling was protest police brutality. Instead, it's been framed by both the league and by media, both you know, mainstream media and obviously um, some of the more conservative media outlets as a protest against the flag. Right. That's not what it is. Kneeling for the national anthem is not protesting the flag. It's kneeling to protest injustice. Um, and my response is twofold. One, it's a First Amendment issue. Mm -hmm. So you are right to do you know, what you want within a, a legally accepted way. And there's nothing illegal about kneeling in front of uh, the flag. And two, what I find ironic is that in some of the same people who are complaining about kneeling in front of the, or during the national anthem, or quote unquote protesting the flag, have no qualms with Confederate symbols right. when, in my opinion, the greater affront to our flag, quote unquote, is the Confederate flag or Confederate war heroes. Uh, that's treason. So again, to me, th th there, there doesn't seem to be an equitable uh, discourse here in terms of what protest really means and the exercise of free speech. So how would you rate the media's coverage of the whole kneeling episode? Uh, has it been fair? Has it been lost? Or are they just trying to make money off it like everyone else? So it, it started off, um, I think, in a very responsive way. And I think then, especially when sports media began covering it, mm -hmm. I think sports media kind of got tired of covering it. Right. Um, keep in mind, sports media also depends on the revenue of the leagues they cover. Right. And the NFL has lost revenue. Um, from both sides, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's no, uh, uh, you know, uh, secret about the fact that there is a large number of NFL fans who are more politically conservative yeah. and who do buy into the, the idea that kneeling for the flag is somehow a disrespect to the country. Sure. So let's take a step back because I think to appreciate what's going on right now, we should appreciate where we've come from. How have we progressed as a nation since Dr. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech at the Lincoln Memorial in 1963? Have we made much progress? Have we gone backwards? Where do we stand from your point of view? We have made so much progress that I think sometimes uh, even people who are on the side of ongoing progress uh, overlook or fail to appreciate mm -hmm. uh, where we are. I think this has been a challenge. You know, we always um, live in the moment or we always think about what we don't have yet without stepping back and appreciating what has come to pass. And I think in the last 50 plus years, not only has there been significant progress, but that significant progress has been institutionalized. Now. There have been attempts to roll back that progress, but I've always said progress cannot be denied. Progress cannot be wholly undone. Um, but I think what we're experiencing now is this extreme apprehension about going backwards or not making enough progress. But I would just put, put it in this framework. Ten years ago, no one thought about the idea of marriage equality becoming a normal part of the American social fabric. Today, not only is marriage equality accepted as a given by both sides of the ideological spectrum, despite the best efforts of some, um, to try to contravene it, um, it's also I think a, a wonderful statement to show that we are now seeing that progress extend to other areas as well. Uh, 
Minneapolis just elected its first transgender uh, city council member. Um, the Virginia House of Delegates just elected uh, its first transgender member, who, by the way, ran against uh, a conservative who billed himself as Virginia's chief homophobe. That's right. So again, we are seeing this progress. And for younger people, I think that progress isn't coming soon enough, and some do get disillusioned. But there is a long arc of history, and I firmly believe that that progress, that arc, will continue. It'll be slow, but it'll continue. So let's go from the media and what we've seen on a day-to-day -day standpoint. Let's go to politics now. What is the responsibility of our elected leaders? And yes, we have to address even our current president in terms of the narrative that they're crafting, because State of Mind's always been about the college environment and the students that you know, make up the college environment. They're seeing this every day. This is the leader of the free nation. This is our political leader. And what type of responsibility should he have and how should he be conducting himself when it comes to matters such as these? I think this is where we have a situation where our country's checks and balances are fundamentally being tested. They're being tested because we have many elected officials who are afraid to speak out for two reasons. One, for their own self-preservation, and two, because they realize that the effort to speak out against or hold you know, the president or whomever else accountable will spark a massive response, particularly on social media. Again, social media has become weaponized. Right. And ideologically, it's creating these alternate realities. And public officials um, are not immune to those alternate realities. And I think what's happening right now is you have a political class that fundamentally does not know how to respond and more importantly, you have elected officials at the state, local, and federal level who are more, I think, concerned about where their next donation is going to come from right. rather than where their constituents' greatest needs are. All right, so let's take it to the <coughs> academic level now. Um, you work with many academic institutions. What is their responsibility in all of this, and how can they fit in and make sure that they're crafting the right response because they're also responsible for molding the minds of the country's future. I think first off, what a lot of us need to understand is that the ideas that are being crafted in academia sometimes are being crafted in a bubble, A. B, I don't like the idea that being on the left of center, where a lot of the humanities kind of exists, necessarily makes one progressive. I think you have a lot of reactive intellectualism taking shape um, that's also preventing students from really engaging with the world they live in. Mm -hmm. And I think that cocooning can be very harmful. And I think what academia needs to realize is that the free exchange of ideas must be sacrosanct. And, and yes, free speech can be offensive, but the First Amendment guarantees the freedom to offend, that's not right. the freedom to, you know, from being offended. Correct. So I think that's a really fundamental truth that universities and, and higher education institutions of all kinds must appreciate and must try to acknowledge. So if I'm a young African-American college student, how do I best approach and address what's being presented in front of me? Because this, is, this would cut very close to home. And on the flip side, if I'm a non-African-American student, how do I address the very same issues without the perspective or the history or the, most importantly, the connection to the suffering that's been existing? You know, I. I lectured at a class at Penn State a few weeks ago, and uh, a student, an African-American student, um, said that being in a classroom um, was suffocating because she has said she will not speak with a white student unless that white person checks his or her privilege first. 
and while I understand where that student is coming from, I think that for a lot of students, they're trying to figure out who they are, and they're trying to understand where they fit in. And I think for African American students, the most important thing is to understand that everyone comes from a place, and that journey is going to be evolving. I will tell you, I've gone to college with guys who were the most ideologically liberal people you'll ever meet. Um, and you know, they were people of color, like me, um, who are now much more conservative in their worldviews and much more dismissive of some of the causes that we were all um, moving together on over 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And for non-African American students, I think being able to engage and being aware of systematic factors, but at the same time just not necessarily um, trying to over-empathize. I think there's a fine line between you know, attempts at empathy and condescension. And I think that there has to be a, an attempt to just speak on equal terms. Well, on that note, I think that's a great way to end off our show. We could obviously talk about this topic for much longer. And thank you, as always, for joining us back on State of Mind, Marley. Thank you so much for Krishna. That'll wrap up our show for today. I'd like to thank Dr. Marley Balaji for joining us today to provide his perspectives. If you like what you saw in today's episode, please like, share, comment, and subscribe on the following social media platforms at the end of the show. We'd also like to thank the Youth Channel's team for their support in this production. If you'd like to learn more about Manhattan Neighborhood Network's Youth Channel, please visit mnn.org youth. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for the time. And remember, every life is a book. Make yours a bestseller. Have a good night.